There they go. <coughs> well, good morning. We are, of course, in this series with Hebrews, and our entire preaching team has done an amazing job. And from chapter 4, verse 14, until the end of the section we're going to read today and cover in chapter 10, verse 39, is a long section in the book of Hebrews covering this topic of Jesus as our high priest. As we conclude this, we're finally we're going to get to the issues in coming weeks of why this is so important. Have you ever actually thought and asked yourself, why is the writer of Hebrews spending so much time? Because the implications are very important to us. So without going any further, we're going to go ahead and look at the passage today. It's not the entire chapter, but in chapter 10, verses 26 to 39. Let me just read this to you. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much more, how much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he has sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, <clears throat> I will repay, and again the Lord will judge his people. <clears throat> it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised for yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and persevere their, and preserve their souls. Before going any further, let us, let us pray. We praise you, Father, for your word, that it was written for our instruction. It is written, God, as love letters to us. It is written, God, to tell us what we need to know. It is to allow us, God, to escape, God, the, the pitfalls of life. And it allow us, God, to glean heavenly wisdom that we cannot possibly have unless you reveal it to us. And we pray, God, in particularly this passage of scripture that is notoriously difficult, that, God, by your spirit, you are here and guiding us, Lord, in the truth. Grant us your understanding and its proper application, God, for each of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your handout, it would be helpful. And just as I say this, I give you a slide that is not on your handout. <laughs> How's that? How's that? This, again, this is a concluding passage and if you recall what is going on in the book of Hebrews, the pressure is great from Rome because Rome demands full allegiance to their king, Caesar. And the dilemma wasn't that Christians desired to worship Jesus. It was that Caesar demanded sole allegiance. So what do you do? Do you and should you be swayed to say, well, I will follow the governing authorities, and so therefore I will not, at least publicly, make it known that I am following Jesus? Or do you walk away and simply say, well, forget this Jesus stuff. 
after all, my livelihood is at stake, my family is at stake. Actually, our very lives are at stake because Rome is threatening us with death. But Christians of the day took an amazing stand and said, we live here in the Roman province, but we will not deny Jesus. And many, many of them did that to their very death. And that's why we have many martyrs in the faith. This book, particularly as um, we have now gone through most of the book of Hebrews, I want to go through several passages that are called the warning passages in the book of Hebrews. There are many, actually, by the way, uh, but just a few. And we, we don't have time to go into this in any great lengths. But, uh, for example, if you just want to jot these down. The first is really this idea of do not drift away by neglecting your salvation. In, in chapter 2, verse 1, it says, we must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. It's kind of interesting as we looked at the preaching calendar, as I look back on the preaching calendar, I, I get to do all the warning passages. <laughs> so you can say, hey, Pastor Johnson, have you said that before? It might sound very familiar to you in terms of some of the pr um, messages I've preached in this series. In Galatians chapter, uh, Galatians, in chapter 3, verse 7 to chapter 4, verse 16, you have this issue of do not have an evil and unbelieving heart. In um, chapter 3, verse 6, it says, but Christ is faithful as the son over God's house, and we are his house, if indeed we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory verse 12, see to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. And also in this passage in verse 14, we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. So again, this idea of living under Caesar's rule and yet acknowledging Jesus to the very end. Chapter 4, verse 2, do not miss this treasure of the gospel when it is uh, proclaimed. Verse 2 says in chapter 4, verse 2, we also, for we also have had the good news proclaimed to us just as they did, but the message they heard was of no value to them because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. So it is very possible to receive the gospel, but it doesn't benefit you at all. And that is a warning that we, we should not allow this to happen. This next section in chapter 5, verse 11 to chapter 6, verse 20, a key, key section in one of the parallel passages for this section in chapter 10, in chapter 6, particularly verses 4 to 8. And it's so um, good. I'm just going to read that to you, and y you will see how it applies to much that is said today. It is impossible... For those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, and who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. To their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. Land that drinks in the rain, often falling on it, and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is farmed, receives the blessing of God. But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. You will remember that the key question of that message was, can you lose your salvation? And the idea here in chapter 6 and what the writer of Hebrews is saying is not so much that you can lose your salvation, it's that those that profess to be a Christian, when you look back in your lives, it's nothing but thorn and thistles. And if you are producing nothing but thorns and thistles, guess what? You were probably never saved. And so that was a great warning that we received in chapter 6. Today, we're going to be looking at this willful uh, do not willfully persist in sin after receiving the knowledge of truth. And here in chapter 10, particularly this warning pass, uh, section in verses 26 to 31, just to let you guys know, today we're going to be spending an inordinate amount of time in the beginning of the message in this passage, not because we run out of time and so that later on we don't have enough time. It's just because it's concentrated, it demands more attention in the earlier verses. Just to let you guys know so that I'm the, just rushing through the end and you go, oh, Pastor Johnson must have ran out of time. Uh, we also then, in chapter 10, in latter verses 32 to 39, it says, do not shrink back from faith and conscience. Then also in chapter 12, we have the final warning 
sections. Verses 15 to 17, or you can say even 14 to 17. <clears throat> Do not be like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal, if you recall that story. And then finally, from verses 18 to 29, also in chapter 12, do not despise the grace of God and refuse him who speaks from heaven. Particularly, if you think of verse 25, see to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? Ah, so you've had human warning and now you've got a divine warning, and if you dismiss the divine warning, what is left? Okay, so here you have this list already of um, this background of warnings that we have in the book of Hebrews. <coughs> I guess now is a good time that we can say the handout is finally useful, and we can go to our first point. <laughs> okay, what then is our first point? The first point here is deliberate rejection is descriptive of apostasy and again not to read through the verses all over again but you can see from verses 26 to 20 on the slide but the idea is if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth there is no longer remains a sacrifice for sins but a fearful expectation of judgment that should be expected and a fury of fire will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. That's the law, and the law is not broken. It's either fulfilled or it is applied. So we have these verses that uh, give great warning to us. And from, 20, um, from 29 on to 31, it is thing culminating in this, these verses it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. Now, of the living God. You would think, wait, that sounds familiar. Isn't that Jonathan Edwards' sermon? Jonathan Edwards did preach a sermon, uh, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, but he did not use this text. <laughs> I think it would have been a great text to use. Jonathan Edwards certainly could have used this text, but he actually used uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 35 which is great and striking in its day, that three-hour sermon that was read monotone without looking up, reading his notes, people were in such dire fear that they held on, that the story has, says, held on to their pews thinking that any time the ground was going to open up and swallow them up. That's how vivid his sermon was for the day. What, what is happening here, this, this we, we have to see in Scripture several things. Number one, he is addressing those of us who call ourselves Christians. Because after all, what good is this warning if it is for those who say, I don't follow Jesus? Well, we're all in agreement. If you say you don't follow Jesus, then therefore you are ones that are, that are not following Jesus. And if you're not following Jesus, you don't claim the benefits that Jesus gives. The problem then is in this church in the, uh, this Hebrew church is that you have ones that are claiming to be followers of Jesus but aren't followers of Jesus. Now, this is a problem. And we have a, we've had this problem throughout history, but particularly perhaps in America. We have a unique brand of it where we think somehow if you said a prayer when you were five years old or you went to Sunday school once, you raised your hand in VBS or you did something like that and you go, well, I remember I did that and I have a piece of paper to show that I did that, I'm going to heaven. And so therefore, I can live however I want. See? And so the temptation may be, if we want to apply it back to the first century with the with Roman government, I've already said yes to Jesus once, I can now bow down to Caesar anytime. I can live my life the way I want. Because, after all, I've said this prayer for salvation, but I've not really given my life an intention of living in any way, of acknowledging that God is really the God of heaven. And I, again, this whole issue, too, if you think back, and I was going to put this other part of the message, but I'll say this now. For six chapters and more that uh, in, in the writer of Hebrews has been pointing us in that Jesus Christ is our high priest. Have you ever thought why he said high priest and he didn't say high king or high prophet? 
Those are titles of Jesus as well. But the focus on Jesus as king would mean he has authority over us, which is true. And I guess he could have made a case for that. But it, it doesn't really resonate with, it, with the message that he, that he really wants to get, get through. And he doesn't say, Jesus, our high prophet, because the prophet speaks for God. And so it, it doesn't really help that now the law is bearing down on us, and now the great high prophet speaks, and it's bearing down on us even more. But it's Jesus, our great high priest, ah, that is able to come in his incarnation in flesh. Says, I am with you, and I lift you up. See, it's interesting. So titles matter. Words matter. So this whole idea, why Jesus being a priest is able to scoop us up and offer us to God, because that was the job of a priest, to offer people to God. The king ruled over his people. The prophet spoke for God, but the priest then, with the people, brought them to God. And Jesus is our great high priest. If you're wondering, by the way, how this last six chapters with these verses connect together, because as we're going through this and the temptation is to walk away and if we willfully go on sinning, what's going to bring us back? We, we, we need a high priest. A prophet isn't going to help in one sense. A king isn't necessarily going to help. We need a high priest. Well, let's look further on this first point. <coughs> The idea here in verse 26 is continual, deliberate sinning and outright rejection of Jesus Christ. These type of warning passages in Hebrews, some of you, especially those with more sensitive souls, are asking you right now, is that me? Is that me? Could that possibly me? And for most of you here, it probably is not you. I don't want to give you false assurance. But if you're a believer, and if you are living for Jesus, and you say, I've seen life change, I continue to pursue Christ, fantastic, continue to do that. The warning is given specifically for those, and uh, I'm sure we've met people like this. It may even be you. If you're in the church and you go, you know, I don't really want to do anything. When they tell me to sign up stuff, I never sign up. When they tell me to do this, I never do this. But I'll sit here and take it all in. I like the singing. I like the fellowship. I really love the food. But ask me to change my life, change my thinking, sacrifice. No, nah, it's not really for me. God is saying you got to have some type of heart change, life change. But there's continual, and look at these words, it's very important, continual and deliberate sinning. And I don't have enough time to get into this, but there's different types of sins. There's sins of omission, you just, you, just, you just don't do them. There's sins of commission where you deliberately sin. There's sins of ignorance, there's other types of sins. We're talking about sins of commission, that is with you knowing full well what you're doing, you still do it. And when I, when I describe myself and others and when we sin, it's deliberate moments of insanity because that's what it is. That the reality of Jesus being true and our Savior is lost at that moment and I still continue on in my dumbness and do this. But this it, deliberate sinning, verse 26 also tells us about those that have received the knowledge of the truth. That is, You've, you've been around spiritual things. Whether today you've heard songs being sung. Maybe you've sung them. People have been around things where people have prayed. And people, they've just received so much. And yet, it doesn't quite sink into their very being. This is a, a biblical explanation of why we can have full churches and lean believers. Because the truth then is, even though we cannot say and we are not judges, but God knows the heart of every person, there are people in churches today who are not believers who think they're believers. That's really scary. 
or, or their dependence is on that one prayer as a child, or they had godly parents, or they've been around stuff, Christian stuff. And that's, that's really dangerous. As a matter of fact, he says, this type of situation is an apostasy. What is that? Let's get, let's get to us a little bit. What is apostasy? I don't think that's in your handout as well. So anyway, what is apostasy? It comes from the Greek word apostasia, which means uh, departure or defection. It means revolt or rebellion. Okay? It's this type of meaning when I say it, it of apostasy in, in Scripture. It's a repudiation. It's like a person that used to be among us. And they've come to a place now that says, you know, whether I feel I've learned more, or I've lived many more, whatever it is, they'll say, I've come to a place now I no longer believe. And so no, they're not only not with us or they're not believing anymore, but many times apostasy can lead then to a person we call then an apostate. What then is an apostate? Apostate is simply a person that is involved in apostasy. There are people who walk away from the Christian faith who now then not only say, I don't believe, but say, it's all fake. And Jesus is a fake. And the church is a fake. None of it's real. It's all make-believe. And you know what? Not only do I not believe it, I'll speak against it, and now I'll take it one more step further. I'll fight tooth and nail anybody who says it's true. I am now against it. That's pretty powerful. Is it possible that it can happen? This is, it sounds strange. Can it happen? Of course it can. Of course it can. We have apostates in the Bible. You, you have, for example, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, for Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me, there's that word, and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has also gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Okay. 1 John 2.19, a very clear description of all apostates. They went out from us, but they were not of us. If they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that it might become plain that they all are not of us. And the poster child of an apostate in Scripture is Judas Iscariot. Three years walking with Jesus, seeing his miracles. You see, this is why miracles will never be enough to, uh, to really truly convince me. It's the work of God in the person's heart. If the person says, if I can only see a miracle, I'll believe. Well, how many miracles did Judas see? And he still betrayed the Son of God. I won't even mention this man's name right now, but there's a pretty famous professor right now. As a matter of fact, <laughs> I know people who went to seminary with him. Um, he's in his 70s now. A well-known evangelical seminary. Okay? Pastored many years. Had a lull in his ministry. Started thinking about stuff. Quietly then for the next 15 years turned to liberal theology, something else. A little another step away. Until finally he said, you know what? I don't think that even God exists anymore. So not only is he not a believer, a pastor, a leader, he doesn't even believe in God exists. Well, do you think that's the end of his career? No, it's blossoming. Why? Because the God, the God of this world and the system of this world loves this man. He now teaches in a very prestigious, he is actually, um, holds the chair as a distinguished professor of religion at a very well-known university. His works are recorded and used by atheists. And it blows my mind that you can have a person who doesn't believe in God specialize in God. Here we are. This is our world today. This is craziness and insanity. But here you have an apostate by the very definition. A person, and, they, and the world loves it. Why? Because this guy has inside information. You see, ooh, he was a pastor. He really knows. But you read his uh, reasoning, it's delusional and it is so off. But it is possible 
that you have a person that could be in the pulpit, writing commentaries, speaking on radio, you know, whatever it is, be the face of a person leading in God and yet turn their backs fully on God. And here he is today, because I don't believe, I, I don't believe there's a God. And there's people on his blog, I had to have an opportunity just to take a look at it, trying to convince him that says, even though you don't believe there's a God, perhaps God is using you in the greater good for people to come to him. He says, well, only if there is a God. There are warnings in scripture against apostates. And we have to take this to heart today. Let's move on. Number two, how do we prevent apostasy in our lives? Okay, this is the application. If Jesus is our great high priest and the pressures then of walking away is so great, of even denying our faith, what then prevents apostasy? I'll quickly then read this passage again from 32 to 34. But recall the former days when you were enlightened you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better position, a possession and an abiding one. Look at all that activity. They're able to endure suffering and hardship. Why? Because they like pain and suffering? No, because they know what is true. And it's worthwhile. And what, what the key word for this passage and this, this, this section here is remember. Remember. Sometimes we forget. We forget the age-old, great old story of Scripture. And we forget. He says, remember. Remember many things. Well, several things to remember. Let's take a look at what we should remember. The first is we remember when God showed you the truth. What's your story when God showed you this damn truth? I heard the truth many times in my life growing up as a kid. My, my father was my first Sunday school teacher. My grandfather was a Christian school principal. Okay? I had aunts and uncles that were elders and deacons. I actually just, re, you know, well, years later, I learned out. I actually have a cousin who is a priest in New Zealand. That's interesting. <laughs> uh, right? We have all these people around me that, that were in the Lord and God doing different things. But God didn't really reveal himself in truth, in reality, in changing my life till I was around 16 or 17, even though I was baptized at 13. I know, that's a weird story, but it's the truth. Um, so is it really conversion or is it mental ascent? We have to tell that to story. When did God show you the truth? So in verse 32, that's what we're talking about, remembering those things. Also in verse 32, remember how you endured and struggled for the truth. You sacrificed things. There were things that you said yes to and these things that you said no to when you first came to Christ. Those things are important. Remember that. The freshness of it. The beauty of the weight of sin lifted from your life. The glory of God filling your life and you're saying, me and God together, we can do anything. Because it's true. Remember your public reproach and affliction. This was the call of every first century believer. You want to follow Jesus? Prepare for public ridicule. Prepare for death. You may never see your family again. There are people today, because of the public profession, are disowned by their family. So it's not just then, it's today too. But remember, public reproach and affliction was par course. So this wasn't like, hey, I really like this. You know, American Christianity, everything's got to be like really convenient and cozy and comfortable. No, it looks like, you want to sign up for this? You're going to sign up to be killed and targeted. What do you think? Where, you, where do I sign up, right? Not a long line. So those that really God touched with the truth were saying, this is so real, I was willing to do this. I was willing to put my life on the line. And then finally, verse 34, remember your compassion for those in need, those in prison, those who are suffering. These were acts that the first century did. We didn't, they didn't have these uh, you know, s uh, social justice programs. Or the church was the social justice program because they cared for the people in their midst. People didn't have a meal, get them a meal. People didn't have a place to stay, give them some place to stay. They need some extra clothes, great, give them some extra clothes. Whatever it was, the church took care of their own. And they had compassion those in need. So those in prison, those in leper colonies, whatever it was, and they did that. And somewhere along the way, perhaps, now in Christianity here, we're talking about 30 years after Jesus' resurrection. Maybe it's not as fresh anymore. 30 years into it. I mean, we look back, it's 2,000 years, but for them, 30 years, because, hey, I already know that. 
we forget. The key word here is to remember. Move on to number three. Hold tightly to your confidence in the Lord. I believe that the Lord gives a special blessing to new believers. And I've seen it in my own life. I've seen it for people who come to Christ. It seems like everything just lines up for them. It's, it's wonderful. The, to show the work of God in their lives. And as you grow, it's not that God doesn't continue to have his hand on you and bless you, but he, he, he withdraws those things because he wants you to learn to live by faith and not these things that are just happening. And, w- and, and what happens, what tends to happen in verse 35 here and 36 is sometimes we forget it says, therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. Again, the, the example of Jesus is helpful, very helpful. Him enduring to the cross, enduring to the end. His confidence in the Father is we, we should have the confidence just as Jesus has and we have our confidence in him. But when we lose our confidence, you lose everything. Because when you lose your confidence... You won't be able to get out of the bed morning. You won't be able to leave your front door. Don't lose your confidence in the Lord. Don't throw away your confidence in verse 35. And verse 36, grow in your endurance. You know, um, it's wonderful seeing kids get bigger and stronger. You know, you, you show a kid with a rubber band, and if he can, hey, can you pull the rubber band for me? He goes, done. Now as they get old, they say, can you pull the rubber band and hold it for five seconds? Oh, wow, that's really good. Now as you get to the other adult, he says, I'm going to give you this power band, and can you hold this for a minute? Go, oh, it's really hard. Can you hold a band and endure to the end of your life, Christ? That's what he's calling us to do as we grow in our faith. Grow in your endurance. Some of us don't endure. You know, if, if you're a long-distance runner, if you do something long-term like that, you learn the value of, of endurance. Some of us are really great. In, 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 we, we, go, we love hiking and things like that, long distance. And it, it gives us a great picture for endurance. And some of us, we, you know, we, we go around the block and say, okay, that's enough. <laughs> okay. God says, I want you to go around the block and then add to it and keep adding to it and keep adding to it. So in your life, in your Christian life, you do this and you continue and you add to it and you add to it until you can endure more than you ever thought. And that's how endurance works. Quickly, as we keep moving on. Number four. Four. If we can go to the next slide. Uh, Persevere knowing Jesus is coming back soon. It's in the same vein here of confidence and endurance. Persevere knowing Jesus has come back. But now there's a different reason. There's a different reason. So many parables about lazy servants and people doing what they want, not understanding that time on earth is limited. And the owner of the field, the owner of the business is coming back and he wants an accounting. And he's going to wonder, he's going to wonder, he says, what did you do with all that time I gave you? What did you do with all those talents and resources I threw your way? Uh, uh, Lord, here it is, and I just give it back to you. Or did you put it to work? Verses 37 to 39. Ah, for yet a little while, I love that word, because here we seem that life is so long, it's actually so short. Time itself will be no more. Yet in a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. Jesus, because of his grace in 2,000 years, has waited and by his grace so that more and more people can come to him. And so they are tricked into thinking, well, he's not coming. Just like Moses, he went up on the mountain. I don't know where that guy is. Let's do what we want to do. And they're tricked into thinking, He's not coming back down. Jesus went up to heaven. Maybe he likes it up there so much, he's not going to come back. And we'll get tricked. And he says, don't lose sight of this fact. Verse 38, but my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Again, this whole issue of being apostate, that doesn't bring pleasure to God. If we, again, we, we shrink back, but we are not of those. Look at that. He's very clear to 
clarified that if you truly are his, you truly are his forever. You don't become, you are truly his, and then there comes a time you are not truly his. Verse 39, but we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. Look at that. Your souls are preserved if you don't shrink back. How do you know how to persevere? You know how? You persevere. That is, you continue to come to church. You continue to meet with believers. You continue to read your Bibles. You continue to pray. You continue in these things that Jesus tells us to do. And in the persevering, you hold on to Jesus and you fulfill what is pictured here in verses 37, 39. It's not difficult, is it? But he's talking long term. Any kid can pull the rubber band for half a second. Jesus says, I want you to hold this tension for your entire life. And you know what? It's really not that long. It's not that long. Let's look at these points real quick. Next slide. Verse 37, in a little while, he will return. He's coming back. He really is. We, I believe, are in the final generation. He is coming back. And every day that goes back is a day closer to Jesus coming. Also, not worried about life and death type of issues. Why? Because if I'm secure in Jesus, I am indestructible until he's taking me home. And if he allows me to be taken home, hey, guess what? It's good. So um, you don't have to worry about that kind of stuff if you settle that thing, that kind of stuff in your mind. Meanwhile, live by faith. That means don't live by your sight, what you feel, your circumstances. Many people will only decide stuff based on their circumstances. If you did that, you'd never live by faith, by definition. And we're going to hear more about that next week, what that means. But if we're living by sight, we're not living by faith. We live by circumstances, we're not living by faith. If we live, live by our feelings, we're not living by faith. So faith says, I will only live according to what Jesus has described to me as that new reality, a new reality, a true reality, not the reality that I see with my eyes and the world portrays to me, and that the devil would like to trick me into believing. See, the world would have us to believe that you have all the time in the world. Not true. The world would have us to be, and the devil would want to just trick us into believing, you know what, God is so busy out there, he doesn't, he doesn't really care for you. Not true. Is it, oh, there's so many people in this world, there's so many problems, what can you do? You probably can't do anything much. Not true. Because we're called to do what God has placed in front of us to do. And so we have to operate and learn to operate by faith. Operating by faith has nothing to do with then how we we're, we're feeling, thinking, things like that. We just have to say, God, what is it by faith you're saying to lead us? It's a huge way to, a, and a different way to, to live. Verse 38, do not shrink back. That's why it was so sad to read after Peter's denial for him to go back fishing. Judas, though, didn't even give Jesus any time to do that. He was just remorseful in his self-pity to take his own life. But don't shrink back. That is, the ground that you have gained in your Christian life, don't, don't take it back. Okay? And also then, live as those whose full faith and those who pers- preserve their souls, knowing that you are either building into your soul for eternity or you're distracted and it's wood, hay, and stubble. It's, it's just all going to be burned away. But let it be gold, silver, precious stones every day for the Lord. Okay. We got to quit. So let's, we got to okay, move on to application steps. There's five application steps I want us to take a look at as we look at these, a very significant uh, warning passage in Scripture. One, what is the definition of apostasy and why is it so devastating? And we talk about this. It's not for those who don't believe. It's those that say they do believe. So question one, do you believe? You say yes. Well, great. Then this warning is for you. (laughs) How are then you living? Are you living? Can you say that I don't believe not because I have simply agreement with what the gospel points are, but I can show from my life. I had a scary conversation one time with a guy in ministry. He was, a, he, was a, he was an intern 
And he says, you know what? Honestly, I'll tell you, I've never felt God, and I've never felt that I can get close to God, and I felt that there's nothing been different in my life ever since I came to Jesus. That was the scariest testimony I ever heard. We have to have stuff to say, this is how God has changed me. Okay. Number two, have you known anyone who has actively walked away from their faith in Jesus? Well, then we need to pray for them. Because that's what the warning is, to say that they are, it allows for them, the great high priest itself. But if, if we discount Jesus, there is no other way. But those who walk away, it is still the same. They have to come back to Jesus. They can't now go back to something else. It is Jesus that is going to bring them as the great high priest to the Father. Okay? Again, at this point, they don't really need to hear from the king or the prophet. They need to hear from a priest that's going to bring them up. Number three, how can you protect yourself from apostasy? Persevere in the things that God has said, okay, to build up. Number four, faith is a key component in our growth as believers and as a deterrent to apostasy. How can you grow more in the word of God? Do you have a plan to immerse yourself in the word of God daily? Again, we're going to uh, be talking to you guys in, in future days as we start 2024. To desire for us to read the word together, a plan together. It's going to be wonderful. Number five, how are you preserving your soul daily? Share with others whether this has been a growing year, declining year, or a stagnant year for you. We should be able, now we're getting come, coming close to the end of the year, should be able to say a word or two about that. Much for us to think about and ponder as we come before the word of God and for God to work in our hearts. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for your warning only because you love us so much for us not to be deluded by our own thoughts to think that we are yours when we are not but also to heed your warning, Lord, and to see, Lord, those who have gone astray into apostasy step by step, little by little. These are for those that are even now, perhaps, in this congregation thinking, maybe I should walk away from this. Maybe this isn't real. This is that warning for you to hold fast to what is true. The things that you know from the very early days to hold fast to him. God, we give ourselves to your hands, new and afresh. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Johnson, for giving us God's word today. Uh, it's so wonderful to be able to worship uh, the Lord with you this morning. Um, if you are worshiping with us for the first time, if you don't mind just slipping up your hands uh, so that we can recognize you and just um, uh, get to know you a little bit better. All right, we have some right there in the middle. Welcome. The ushers will probably come around with a, 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 um, a, a yellow slip for you to fill out and so we can get to know you a little bit more. Right, anyone else? Okay. If not, oh, someone else. Oh, okay. Welcome. So uh, immediately after this, uh, please go downstairs uh, for a time of uh, coffee and fellowship. Um, there'll be uh, donuts and fresh baked cookies and all kinds of good stuff down there. So uh, please join us downstairs. Um, immediately after that will be our Sunday school class. And I'm just going to invite Pastor Johnson to come right back up to tell us a little bit more about the, today's class. We're coming to the end of our uh, Zoomy class. This is the second to the last lesson, and I asked to just come up to say a few words. It's kind of like when Jesus turned water into wine, they said to him, why have you saved the best for last? And this lesson, I have to say, is so compelling. I think it has many things to say of how we are to finish the Great Commission in our lifetime, how we're running our churches how we're thinking about ministry. It is so significant that I would call all of you, whether you've been coming to the class or not, that if you're just going to get, even just to sit in for this week, it's that significant for you to stick around. And uh, I'll, I'll share more, of course, when we're downstairs. But please, please come as we're talking about this, this wild way of um, non-sequential way of growth uh, that the Lord has for us. So I hope to see you down there. All right, uh, coming up next Friday, we will have our cooking class. Uh, you can come uh, learn how to make uh, 
um, uh, was it spaghetti bon bolognese? I, I can't pronounce that very well. I don't know. Uh, bolognese. Um, it's uh, uh, well, if you are interested, uh, from, from five to six p.m. and uh, that's when the cooking class is. You can sign up in the newsletter, or just let me know. I'll, I'll uh, uh, sign. Uh, 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 I'll sign you up, and then uh, yeah, and then immediately after the cooking class, you will get get to try. Uh, the stuff that uh, people made in the cooking class and, and uh, or uh, and other pe uh, things that people will bring for dinner. So it w from 6 to 7 p.m. next Friday will be our uh, Friday night dinner. It's a, it's a potluck. Um, so so uh, it's going to be in the first floor dining area. Uh, you don't need to sign up for that at all. Just show up. Um, if you don't have time to cook, uh, that's fine as well. Just um, uh, come anyways. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a way for us to also tr uh, try to help. Uh, uh, feed some of the helpers that, that are going to be involved in CIA and Awana that night. So, uh, so yeah, please uh, join us. Um, all right, so we had a, a wonderful English uh, retreat uh, recently, and there's a picture of us um, uh, there at the retreat. Um, so every year, um, we do depend on the goodness and the generosity of our congregation to to meet uh, our uh, uh, our retreat um, uh, budget. And so, if uh, we uh, currently that's uh, um, that amount is forty five hundred. So, if the Lord's leading you to um, make a contribution in that way, pl uh, please do. It's a tax de deductible gift. Uh, make the check out to CCIC uh, SJ and just put in the memo English retreat uh, donation, and then you can drop it off in uh, in the donation box. Uh, Something new this year is that the men's, men's ministry is partnering with uh, city team ministries uh, in helping uh, uh, with the, uh, the, the men's uh, there um, and providing um, clothing for the, for the men. So there you'll find a, a big blue barrel downstairs as you enter the church. Uh, if you have any clothing uh, um, uh, gently used or, or new clothing, um, uh, please uh, put those in, uh, in the bin below. Uh, socks and underwear have to be new, and uh, and also th we're also t uh, taking hygiene items, uh, soap, shampoo, deodorant. I think those have to be new as well. I think. Uh, weekly uh, prayer meeting is happening every Thursday at 8 p.m. Um, there is a Zoom link in the newsletter and in the bulletin. Um, so. Um, uh, please join us uh, in in praying uh, for our congregation and for just anything that's uh, that you need prayer for. And if you even if you can't make it, uh, please let us know about uh, any prayer requests that you do have, uh, there, uh, and just send an email to one of the pastors, or maybe uh, uh, there's also a, a, a link there to to fill in uh, your requests. So next week, uh, Pastor Chris will be uh, sharing us um, uh, God's message on Hebrews 11. One through forty on uh, some faithful examples. Okay. All right, um, please rise for, uh, for your benediction. Now receive this as your benediction from Numbers six twenty-four to tw uh, twenty-six. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you. Hope to see you downstairs.